I love the title of this series called Love Letters. Uh, three letters written by a guy that we believe his name is John. But he doesn't say his name in the letters. Matter of fact, uh, the first letter is kind of anonymous. He doesn't even mention himself. And then in the second two letters that we attribute to John, he's just known as the elder. The elder sounds very mysterious. But uh, simply, he was an overseer overseeing churches in what was uh, Ephesus at that time, probably several house churches in Ephesus at that time that were predominantly um, were mainly Jewish believers in the faith, but also with some Gentiles. We'll talk about that later. But there was a crisis. There's a crisis that some of those people that had come to know Christ and received the gospel later on were twisted in their beliefs and their theology, and they began to no longer believe that Jesus was not only the Son of God, but that he was not the Messiah. And so they were beginning to attack the Christian believers that were there, those that held true to the gospel or what we call salvific doctrine. What do you have to be, believe to be saved? That Jesus was the Son of God, right? Born of a virgin, lived a sinless life died a death on the cross, rose again, he's coming back again, right? The salvation doctrine. So when you stop believing Jesus is the Son of God or the Messiah, you're back to being lost again. But they began to attack those that were living in the truth. And so the second and third letters of John were, were he really deals with that conflict, and we'll deal with that later. But in the very beginning of John, he lays a foundation, he lays a foundation as this writer, and he starts to develop these core ideas of this foundation of, you know, about life, about love, about truth, and it's all about Jesus, but why did he have the ability to speak to them as the elder? And uh, William Barclay, who is one of my favorite commentary writers, especially uh, Pauline Letters, but I won't get into all of that, but he said, he, I like the way he breaks down the different truths in Scripture. William Barclay calls the opening of this letter, or the first four verses that will be our concentration, he calls it the pastor's aim, the pastor's right to speak, and the pastor's message. It's why a pastor does what he does, why he or she has the right to speak, and what that message is to the church. So it's not really the elder. Think of this guy as the pastor over these churches, and he lays a foundation of why you should listen to me, and then it's what he's going to tell them about. And I think you're going to understand very uh, clearly that he had the authority to begin to share everything else that we're going to hear tonight. But before we get to that, I have one question. You know how I like to have a question? Your job by the end of tonight, and I'm speaking primarily to those that are here in the auditorium, it is a question for you online as well, but you'll understand why it's more for the auditorium. Why are you here? Why are you here physically on a Wednesday night when you could do anything? Why do you come physically on a Sunday or a Wednesday? We have this great thing called the internet. You can watch online. You can do things from the comfort of your home. I was just thinking about that. You know, when I was traveling, I was actually watching online in between plane flights, watching the service. And I love that convenience. And I know that there's some that you can't get here. Uh, I'm thinking about Virginia. I'm thinking about some other people that are friends of mine that you can't get here physically because of uh, physical capabilities or snowbirds that haven't come. We got a couple from Iowa back already, but pretty soon the snowbirds are leaking back. I know that you're there at a distance. And there's some that can't get here because of traveling after work. I get it. I get it. I get it. But guys, you could be home. You could be in the comfort of your home. When I was thinking about that, you know, I don't have it yet, but I eventually want to get that piece of furniture that when you press that button or pull that lever, it's like, oh, right? You could be watching reclined at home with a full refrigerator or whatever, stocked with whatever you want, yet you're here. Why? Maybe you don't even realize, but I think you'll understand. Some of you already know the answer to that, but you could be doing whatever you're doing. I'm glad that you're here. Trust me, I still want you to come back. I'm glad that you're here online. But I want you to search for something deeper because there's a powerful truth. There's nine themes in the letters of John. This is one of the themes, and he starts right out of the gate with it. So remember, he's a pastor. Why does he have the ability to speak? What is he saying? What's his authority? Listen to this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read it slowly. Out of the gate. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. He's already talking about Jesus, right? 
That which we've seen, he's seen Jesus with his own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our own hands. How cool would it have been to walk with Jesus and to touch him just to give him a hug? Anybody else a hugger? How cool would that be? We're going to get to do that for eternity. I'm going to race you to him. Right, touched with our hands concerning the word of life, speaking of Jesus. The life Jesus was made manifest. He, the Son of God, became flesh and was manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father, speaking of Jesus again, again and was made manifest to us. Now listen to the transition. That which we have seen and heard... We proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, certainly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So first thing I want to say, there's a lot about us and we and our. I want to ask you a question first. Is your identity found primarily in your individuality? Or is your identity, more importantly, being a part of others in a collective community? There's a lot of we and our language here tonight. And that others part, that others idea really isn't that popular in the Western culture. What is our culture all about? And I mean, I think we all have a little bit of this, you know, the id, the super ego. I'm not going to get into all the psychology and stuff. But all we know is this world as we've experienced it myself. And that's where we get our different perceptions. But we're, we're all about me, myself, and I, right? It's hard to be about others because our primary value is usually within ourselves. Our primary experience is within ourselves. And that goes against the expression of Western ideas, which is very individualistic. So for us, I think we even need to hear this more than non-Western cultures that I've been to that already think in a communal way, which we'll talk about that in a second. But our culture is all about me, myself, and I. Have you ever, anybody here, you've just been around other cultures that were not Western, that were already kind of more communal, right? They were more collective. Anybody, raise your hand, please tell me. Or you've been on vacation? Where you've seen, I've lived in Hawaii twice, and I love Hawaii. Fort Myers and Hawaii, come on, those are my two sweet spots spots, my two favorite spaces. I lived in Hawaii, and I'd be, when I had chances, I'd go down to the beach, you know, and I'd go bodyboarding. I can't just sit on a beach. I got to do something. So I'm either in the waves, I'm swimming, snorkeling, or I'm bodyboarding. And so I'm there, I'm taking a break, and here comes all the Asian tourists in Hawaii. And they came, and they come in with this bus, and they park right there in this parking lot, and it's right by the beach. And instead of going to the beach, they go to this little hut, and then they put on these helmets and they start riding segways. I'm talking like 20 people in a row riding segways, and they're not even going fast. Like if I'm riding a segway, I'd be wah, wah. You know, I'd be hopping curbs and doing whatever, and they're all like, must be uniform, must, you know, follow each other. And I'm going, that doesn't look a lot like fun. I wouldn't be going to Hawaii to be riding segways, and I'm thinking, I mean, I'm analytical. There's got to be somebody in there like Russ that says, man, I want to be on the beach right now, right? I don't come to Hawaii to ride Segways. Anybody else thinking that? They all can't want to go shop for trinkets at the same time. You don't see a lot of Westerners come together in big old groups and do the exact same thing. Why? Well, I don't want to do that. I can't even get my wife to agree on the things that we should be doing. When we're talking about a vacation, the kids really need this. The kids really need that. I'm like, the kids don't need a vacation. Their life is a vacation. We, we need the vacation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm tired of talking about others. Well, for being for others, and I'm the pastor, right? That's just one family. But they were having a blast in their collective identity because we view it differently. There's something greater that can happen in the collective. Another one, I was a missionary in Singapore, uh, actually not through Assemblies of God World Missions, but I was uh, hired as a youth pastor, and I just happened to be a youth pastor in Singapore. And you know what they do that we don't do? The entire church, we're talking the entire church goes on vacation together. Now, when I say entire, I don't mean every single one. But the vast, vast majority of them, any one of them that can, and I'm talking 2,500 people 
all getting on buses, going across the causeway into Malaysia. They rent out a whole hotel or whatever. You know, the, everybody, look, can you, how many of you, you know, you're happy to be with each other on Sundays, but you wouldn't think about going on vacation together. How do you get 2,500 people to collectively ask for leave at the same time when they're working probably in 400 different companies? Are you getting this? There's some other cultures that understand this truth more than we do, that when you give up your personal desires to be a part of the greater collective good, you actually get more out of it than you think. We don't think we would like it. Can I tell you those church camps were awesome? Right? That just being together is awesome? But we have this individualistic culture in our culture, especially a secular culture, that it's all about individualism. I'm not going to say the person's name because I'm not going to be bashing some artist, but there's a famous singer artist that was a part of the Disney troupe and such a clean cut kid. And, you know, and all the Disney shows where it shows all the Disney kids having, you know, TV in collective groups of friendships and other kids are watching them have friendships. But when she came out as an individual, you know, she's all about herself and she doesn't need anybody. And I'm not going to say the name, but all of a sudden she's self-empowered. She doesn't need friends. She doesn't need a man. She's her own person. And our culture thought that's, oh, look how empowered she is. Look how bold she is. Look how brave she is. And one of my favorite uh, media Host basically pointed out that her last song was basically about how lonely, how broken, how much she needs people. And she openly just said, it doesn't work. Individualism and isolation sound great to those that have been hurt. Maybe sound great to those that don't want the complexities. You've been hurt, you don't want to try again, or you don't want the complexities of dealing with other people. How many of you realize that when you're dealing with other people, it can be a pain sometimes? It can be grossly inconvenient sometimes. Individuality is great when, you, when you're a control freak and you want to have your way. Who doesn't want to have their way, right? Because when you're dealing with other pe- free pe- people, they have free will, they have free opinions, they, they want to do, you know, it's like vacation with my family. Everybody kind of wants to do their own thing, so you have to work together. How are we going to all have fun together and refresh together even when we're not doing exactly what we want to do? You almost all have to give in something. And there's so much volatility in our world and in our culture that I see more and more people, and I want to say COVID almost I'm not going to say it was purpose, but COVID caused people to become more isolated than ever before. People have gotten into habits to where they just go to work, they go home, and they get on a screen. Right? I'll never forget when I I got here, it was right after the COVID thing had, most of it had blown over, and a man came up to me weeping. And he says, can I have a hug? Folks, I'm being serious. He says, can I have a hug? Because I mentioned I'm a hugger. I gave him a hug. The guy's weeping. He goes, I haven't touched a person in a year. He was a normal person, but just broken because of the isolation. And people have gotten into these habits to where they don't come together like they did before. And now that the world's becoming more volatile and there's more division and friction, people are isolating for their protection, but it's not really healthy for them. I wrote this down. I've never met a happy hermit. I never met a happy hermit. And God not only wants you and I to be happy, he wants us to be completely full of joy. I want you to catch this phrase. Let's read verses three through four again and see if it jumps out to you. Now, it should because I underlined it. (laughs) That which we have seen and heard, Jesus, which we proclaim also to you so that you may too have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. How many want complete joy? How many want full joy? I'm not talking about happy Right? Italian sweet cream in my coffee makes me happy. But it fades quickly. Why am I saying that? Because another person in the church came up and goes, what's the brand again? My wife got the wrong one. Coffee made by Nestle. Italian sweet cream. There you go. That makes me happy. A few little sips every day, but it doesn't solve any problems in life. It doesn't bring any meaning. It doesn't bring any satisfaction. It doesn't bring any values. It doesn't bring great memories. It's enjoyable, but it doesn't bring joy. Are you guys with me? 
But when you come to Christ and his, and his Spirit is in you, there is a joy, His Holy Spirit. But He says there's a subsequent work here. He says that you, our joy may be complete. So I want to talk about two main factors here that you probably know, but you don't value enough to the point to realize that what you really want in complete joy is found in these two things, just in these two verses. Are you ready? Here we go. Your joy will be complete when you show and share the love of Christ with others. John is writing here later in his life to this church, and he knew God, and he knew God's joy. What brought him joy? He was basically saying, testifying about Jesus Christ. Testifying, telling you about Jesus, and writing all of these things that I'm about ready to write to you in this entire letter, because I've seen him, I've touched him, I've experienced him, I know him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We just heard about that. He brings salvation. He gives eternal life. He connects you with the Father. He's everything, and it makes me so happy to write these things to you. Yeah, there's things in the flesh that make us happy. But this joy right here, the Greek word is kara. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Agape love. And agape love gives you kara. He's saying it's a spiritual joy. You can't get what he's talking about because he uses the word kara, which is only for the divine. So your divine joy in Christ will be complete when you show and share the love of Christ with others. It's not just in the revelation of who he is for you. It's that you get to share him with others. How many of you love when you get good news? You, like I joke about the food things, and I can tell you another favorite food place that I go to. You guys want to know? Yeah. Okay, you don't want to know. It's bento foo in the forum. All right, there we go. Most of them are going to be Asians, so just you better start eating Japanese if you're going to hang out with me so, or, or Asian food. But regardless, I mean, that can give you some happiness, but he's saying that there's a spiritual joy. But I get excited when I share anything good with somebody else. Do you know that the best evangelists in Christianity are newborn Christians? Man, they come to know Jesus. I can tell you story after story of ladies that have gotten saved and are back there, a part of uh, the Women's Connect where my wife, Pastor Carrie, is leading. And they come and they're like, Jesus is awesome. And nobody has to tell them, you should probably tell people about Jesus. Do you know that it's commanded in Scripture? They don't even know that yet. He's awesome. Next thing you know, they're bringing their family, bringing their kids, their nephews, whatever. It's a biblical pattern, right? Simon Peter didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't know that he was the Messiah. His lesser-known brother, Andrew, told him. In the very beginning, Andrew came to his brother and says, we found the Messiah. We found the Messiah. Then later on, when he declared it, Jesus says, man has not shown this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, now you don't just know it cerebrally because your brother told you, now it's in your spirit. Right? But Andrew had already told him that he was the Messiah. After he was resurrected from the dead, Mary Magdalene, <laughs> fastest woman runner in history, goes back to the disciples, and what does she say? I've seen the Lord. He's risen. Whoa. Man. Can you imagine being the person that gets to share, the first person to share? He's resurrected. Because without resurrection life, we have no hope. You didn't have to tell them. When you've got the joy of Jesus, you want to share them. There's a lot of people that are Christians that lose that, and we have to maintain that spiritual fire, that passion. And I'm going to tell you this, part of it's just having a fresh revelation of Jesus. I can tell you the best times that I've witnessed, it was actually after I just had a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm already an extrovert. You're saying, oh, you do it because you're an extrovert. Actually, the best witnesses I know are actually hyper introverts. Because you know it has to be the Holy Spirit to help them. I can do it in the flesh all day long. Because I just like talking to people. But when it's the freshness of the Spirit of God and the joy of the Spirit of God in you, there's that extra pack, there's that extra glow. People can see your countenance. The truth is on your face. Can you know, you know what I'm talking about? And there's some Christians that sometimes lose that. They lose that it's not only a command, it's a great joy. I'll never forget. I'm a pretty nice guy. I really am. It takes a lot for me to get angry. But when I do get angry, it's a quick switch. 
I'm nice, I'm nice, I'm nice, and Pastor Tim knows this. I'm nice, I'm nice, I'm nice, but if I've gotten mad, you've burned through about five rumble strips. You know, the, the signs, right? But I went from zero to 100 in a moment when I heard a lady in our coffee shop. We were pastoring a church before we came here. And it was one of our main leaders. The wives of one of our main leaders. And we're talking about these unreached people that you're going to go try to reach. She goes, well, she goes, she goes, that's not my problem. I got Jesus. I'm going to heaven. And I went from, <laughs> isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? And I go, you did not say that in this church. I just, because <laughs> I realized I don't want anybody to ever think it's okay to let somebody die for eternity. People are shocked because I'm Mr. Nice, Russ. And I'm like, ooh. I said, somebody loved you enough, and I just went off. Somebody loved you enough to point you to Jesus. Who's going to tell them? And I was just, Brr. It's a command. Came up with a line when I'm pastoring here. You're going to hear it several times. Hell is too hot. Eternity is too long. And the kingdom of God is too important to not take these things seriously. It's not an option. Jesus said, go. He didn't say, wait until you feel like it. He says, go. Make disciples of all nations. Tell people about me. He says, go, but don't go until you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about this this last Sunday. But we shouldn't do it out of obligation. We shouldn't do it out of guilt. We shouldn't do it out of religious rote. We should check ourselves. If we don't have a desire to share Jesus, maybe we're not full of his Holy Spirit. Maybe I'm talking to myself too. I don't feel like it every single day. It's not a profession. He's speaking from his own personal encounter, but he's writing as a pastor. But can I tell you, God's called every single one of you to be like a pastor and a shepherd to somebody else. He's called every single one of us, you online as well, that we're to be encouragers. I look at Barnabas as the, I just love Barnabas in the Bible, right? He's the one I try to emulate, right? I think there's a lot of commonality there. But you don't have to have a title to be an encourager. You don't have to have a title to point the way. But do you have that pastoral heart? Do you have that passion? And if you don't, and it, there's all sorts of reasons why we don't do certain things, just say, oh God, give me more of you. Take me from glory to glory. Give me a fresh revelation of the darkness that I came from and the light that you've brought me into and to the point to where we have that fresh lens and that fresh passion. Amen? Amen. Put this down. Some of the greatest joys I've had came at great inconvenience. It's not convenient being a witness most of the time. It can be a little awkward. What do you do to reach people when there's only 30 people out of a million that know Jesus? What do you do? You have to move there. See the picture? I was hoping that was sand by a beach. No beach. This summer that we just had, they get that year round. How many think that's convenient? And they're from Minnesota. <laughs> I was just talking to them earlier. It's funny. They said, yeah, our friends from Texas are actually missionaries in Russia. It's funny how God will take people from the cold places and send them to the bacon hot places. And people from the bacon hot places, you know, to the north, to the Klondike. I don't know what, why Klondike, Klondike bar. That's why it's in my mind. I don't know why Klondike keeps popping in. <laughs> right? It's inconvenient. But some of the greatest experiences of my life have been because of those inconveniences. I, love, I want Bible school. I just wanted to pastor some small church. I mean, pastor a small youth group in some place. And I almost said yes to going to this church that had 12 to 15 youth. And I was like, sweet, bite size. I can handle that. And God's like, nope, you're going halfway around the world to Singapore. And I didn't want to go. 180 youth. That's too many. I only made 900 bucks a month. So it wasn't like I was getting rich or anything. I mean, we're talking, it was hot 365 days out of the year. It was summer, humid summer. 90 to 100% humidity, 365 days out of the year, on the equator. Now, the food was good, praise God. But I was going through culture shock. I was going through every kind of shock you could imagine. But when I started seeing, when I started seeing Chinese people 
and Indian people and Malaysians that are coming from Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism, which is so dark and so demonic. And when they would come and they would say, your God is different. Just sensing his presence in the atmosphere of the worship, your God is different. Your God is kind to the kids and I would, our youth. And I would see these young people and I'd see a, a, a girl from a Malaysia that we had to help rescue from her family. She gave her life to the Lord and they were going to kidnap her and send her to some really strange place you know, to try to force her to recant her Christianity and she had to be taken in by another family. But I'm watching the joy of the Lord hit their faces. You think I had a regret? No! It was awesome. You give up a little bit to get so much more. Amen? That my joy, some of the most joyful times of my life was actually halfway around the world or in some island in the middle of nowhere in some hut. They never had electricity, running water, nothing. But they don't, know, they don't get to hear preaching on the Holy Spirit and you're preaching on the Holy Spirit and boom, in that hut, the Holy Spirit happens and people that would never come to church are sensing the Holy Spirit's presence walking by and they come in and I can't even speak the language. Other people are leading them to the Lord, but I got to be a part of that. You think I had regrets? Yes, my back got destroyed on those horrible, they weren't even mattresses, it was horrible. Imagine dinosaur bones and putting some egg foam on it and that's what I slept on. Just stretch in the morning, it'll work out. I wouldn't give up those moments for anything. Anything. I'm kind of being more pastoral than I'm teaching, sorry about that. But I have countless stories seeing people find salvation, find their identity, find their calling and purpose, finding their community. God's word says that when one of them comes to the Lord, not only will your joy be complete, right? Not only will there be greater experiences of joy that we get to have together when we do this, We've heard it so many times, but it says all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to know Jesus Christ. But don't you understand they're experiencing complete joy already? So they're already having effervescent, overflowing joy. It's euphoric. It's unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if they're able to see on earth what's happening, that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I don't know if that's what it is. I don't know if there's an angel that says, hey, everybody, another person gave their lives to the Lord, and then, and then they rejoice because they get it because they're on the other side. They're already in eternity. They understand, but they're already having unbelievable fullnesses of joy, and it increases from what we do here on earth. That's how important it is. That's how exciting it is. And yes, there's inconveniences. Yes, we can go through pain. I, I shared briefly in one of the two services Sunday, there's one of our, our church members, if I said their name, almost most of you would know them. And the person was in the hospital having to get something done. And when I was working on my message on Sunday, I was able to take a break, go, go visit, come back. And all they're doing is talking about all the people that they got to talk to about the Lord, nurses praying with, other patients, you know. And this person's going through a lot of pain. And... I was like, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, you guys have only been here 18 hours and this is all happening. And the wife's telling me, da 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 And I've never seen her so talkative in my life because she's actually pretty quiet most of the time. She goes, I'm actually kind of amazed because I'm really an introvert. I said, but yeah, but you keep growing in the Lord and you have a passion in Jesus and look how stoked and excited you are right now. So fast forward, I go preach Sunday, Monday, person still going through it has to go through a procedure comes out of the procedure and what are they doing you know when you come up out of a procedure and you're in that like waiting room while you're coming off the drugs whatever it is that they put you under with post-op when the guy's supposed to be recovering he texted me lots of witnessing for the lord going on here <laughs> lots of witnessing for the lord going on here you ever come up and you're like man i feel fantastic and i got a captured audience and people in the beds around me they're like, you know, I really think God allowed this to happen because, man, we've got to do a lot of ministry here. And what he's experiencing is one of the two biggest pains I've ever experienced in my life. I would say what it is, but then you would know who it is. I didn't ask his permission. So, number one, your joy will be complete when you share, show and share the love of Christ with others. And number two, your joy will be complete when you include others in your life, church, and friend group. It's not enough to point them to Jesus and connect them with Jesus. Your joy will be complete and it will increase 
as you invite other people or include other people in your life, church, and friend group. Say include. Say inclusive. The number one fastest growing strategy for any ministry, any church, is inclusivity. If you will include other people in your lives, you will never see an end to the people that you will touch and reach for Jesus, and you will never see the end to the growth that God could do in our church. And it's not about our church. It's about his church. He will do the growth, but he expects us to do what? To include other people in our lives. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. And remember, your joy will be complete. The very thing that you want to have happen most are found in these two parts. If we say we have fellowship, say fellowship. I'm doing this for a reason. With him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, speaking of Jesus, we have, say it with me, fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. So in other words, if we have fellowship with him, we have fellowship with one another. If you really sum up those two points and it's giving more descriptives. But that word fellowship here is, and I wish someday I'm going to maybe do a whole sermon series on it, is the Greek word koinonia. It is an incredibly important word. The word fellowship kind of means let's hang out. Let's have fun. And I love hanging out and I love having fun. Don't get me wrong. But the Greek word koinonia means all these things. It means communion, intimate interaction. It means association, that we identify ourselves. It means partnership. It means that you link your life with somebody else for a shared task. Fellowship, of course, enjoying just being together. But it also means sharing and contribution. After this text we're going to talk about when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out, they began immediately to share with each other. But my dad did a whole teaching on this, and I'm just going to sum it up, and we'll eventually do it sometime on a Sunday. The word koinonia literally means shareholder. That when you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, and you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, I have a share in you and you have a share in me, like a mutual fund, right? Right? We can't think of ourselves individualistically like a stock. No, 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 no. We are shareholders, and whenever you have ownership in one another, when you tear them down, you're tearing yourself down. When you're not building them up, their weakness is going to drag you down and vice versa. My dad, I think, shared that testimony. If he didn't, I'll tell you. His pastor friend, I think his name was Pastor Chip Block in Illinois, had an idea that he's going to most ministers from ministerial families we don't know anything about stocks and investments and i actually still don't you got to have money to invest right so regardless but he's like not my family they're going to learn that you know you're going to have to learn to invest and so he bought his son he thought how can i get my son to understand investment so he bought his son mcdonald's stock this is a true story so he bought his son mcdonald's stock and in his stocking stuff for the kids like ah i want french fries i want a burger he goes no 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 this is better than that you're a part owner of McDonald's. You own a share. So he's trying to under teach this young kid. Well, sure enough, they go to church on Sunday. And after Sunday, they're going to go out to eat. And they're going to go to some restaurant. You know, at preachers, you're ready to eat a good meal after a long day at church. You know, you're ready. And the kid goes, Dad, we can't go there. We got to go to McDonald's. He's like, what? He goes, we go there. You're hurting my business. True story. Okay, I got to encourage my kids. So they go to McDonald's. Isn't this great? Now we not only paid money, but part of that is your stock can go up if more people do it. I'm going to cut a long story short. That kid, every single time, we got to go eat McDonald's. And he put up with it like two or three times. And the wife, you know, come on, honey, let's do it. And finally, he made his son sell the stock <laughs> so they could begin to eat other restaurants. But he says, if we go there, we're hurting my business. If we don't go to my, my place that I belong to or I have a share of, we're, hurt, we're not helping our business, right? So when you're a shareholder, you will do everything you can to increase that person's value because it increases your value in them in Jesus. How many think that we need to hear that as a church? What we put into is what we're going to get collectively out of it. It's a shareholder. I put this down. In the kingdom of God, we is more important than me. We is more important than me. But me is what I really know. Me is what I'm comfortable with. Right? 
Me, I can control. I like me. Me likes me. Anybody else with me? You think that way? I like it. Me is what I like. Can I tell you something else? Me gets his way. On my day off, that first morning, it's me. I get a little selfish. But God's word says we is more important. But we can mean a lot of things. Does we mean us that speak English? Does we mean us that are a part of a certain group or from a certain nationality or from a certain culture? Is we those that are a part of a certain hobby or an interest group or a sports group? I'm thinking about a person sitting down here in the front row that's a Jets fan, Pastor Tim Cruz. Very sad. Pastor Tim Cruz is a Jet fan. But he happened to mention to somebody been talking for quite a long time, and as soon as he said he was a Jets fan, that person popped open, and they were like best buds in a nanosecond. I'm like, we have commonality in Jesus Christ. We're Christian brothers and sisters, and that's what gets you excited? The New York Jets? This is the first time they've broken even in decades, I think. I said, what's the ratio? They probably got a one in 10 ratio of winning. God bless them, a man of faith. God's, God's called you for post-tribulation rapture, my brother. <laughs> You got that kind of faith. I'm sorry, that wasn't in the notes. That was anointed of the Lord. (laughs) What does we mean? Does we mean the same denomination? Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Independent, Assemblies of God, right? What does we mean? It means much more than that. See, before the cross, there was two groups. There was Jew and then there was Gentile. Language-wise, there was those that spoke Hebrew, and everybody else, the Hellenistic languages, the Greco-Roman languages. But look what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Look at the immediate response of what happens. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Remember, I talked this last Sunday. This is kind of interesting. I didn't even get to write these notes. I was, had a lot of stuff come up, so I, I barely got my notes done in time. But I just am starting to realize that this is kind of like a dovetail off of this last week, and we're talking about being filled with the Spirit, that you will receive dunamis or ability. And I'm going to say we have the, we're going to receive the ability to be in unity and fellowship by the Spirit, because look what happens. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were setting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance or ability. Verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation. Say every nation. Under heaven. That means everybody was there. And at this sound, the multitude, thousands, came together, and they were bewildered because each one, say each one, was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these fishermen or Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Then he goes into Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egyptian, Egypt and the parts of Libya beyond, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, there, there's, there's Arabians. There's so much in here, but I'm not going to say it. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And it goes on to saying that there was a prophecy of Joel that's saying there's a time coming and now come that all men, young, old, girls, boys, men, women, all nationalities, everyone will be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many think that is awesome? But to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to know who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God. And so in their languages, God supernaturally empowers these people full of the Holy Spirit who would have thought it's all about us Jews that speak Hebrew. And the first thing that God empowers them and enables them is to witness to people that they thought were less than themselves. It was the insiders, the Jews in Israel, and the outsiders, everybody else. And if you were a Hellenistic Jew, right, you were a second-class citizen. I don't have time to go into all of it, but God, by the Spirit, made them testify to them of the wonders of God and witnessing about Jesus Christ. Is that not amazing? But guess what else happened? 
Other people are like, these people are drunk. Go read it. Because they're having such a great time. <laughs> they're full of the Holy Spirit. They're so full of complete joy. People think they're drunk. He says, how oh, these people aren't drunk? Like, you suppose it's in the morning. This isn't inebriated, uh, foolishness, drunk, that the next day you're like, oh, why did I do that? No, this is the kind of joy that it just keeps getting better. Their joy was complete, and they're testifying to outsiders to become insiders. Thousands of them say, what must we do? And Peter stands up, and he tells them the truth about Jesus. And thousands were added to their number that day. The church went from this to this. And go read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 46. Go on your own and read what it looked like. But everybody was together, together with glad and joyful and sincere hearts. And they were loving each other and praying together and meeting together for church and hearing the teaching of God's word. And they were meeting in each other's homes. And they were sharing food with each other and saying, hey, you come on over to my house and I come on over to your house. I got an email right before service from another one of our members that's Indian and Malaysian background. And she's wanting to have us over for dinner. And I'm going to get in. Indian and Malaysian fruit. Hallelujah. I'm so pumped. I immediately salivated at that point. But I'm also looking forward to the fellowship. And there's all these great things that were happening there. And it's the same thing that God's called us to here. Shareholders. Fellowship. Belonging. Identity. I want you to think about now, just turn it to you as I close. What are the most memorable moments you've had in church with fellow Christians in the body of Christ. Think about it right now. What are the most memorable, happy, joyful moments that you have? And I'm sad to tell you, it wasn't when the preacher was speaking. Most of you can't remember what I spoke last Sunday. Doesn't mean that you didn't absorb it. It becomes a part of the God's word becomes a part of our value set. It becomes a part of our paradigm. It becomes a part of us, right? How many can remember that many messages? You've, some of you have heard probably a couple thousand, three thousand messages in your lifetime. You might remember a phrase here or something there. What do you remember? Why are you here? You can watch this online if you're willing to. Thank you online. You could be doing anything and yet you're watching this and you stuck with us. I'll tell you why. Two main reasons for me. Worshiping with you. Besides, it's my job, and I'd be fired if I didn't show up quickly, right? I'd get fired pretty quick if I didn't show up. But I love Sundays. I love Wednesdays. Why? Because I get to worship with you. And my joy is complete. I experience a greater sense of God's presence. There's times that I've come, and it's been a tough week, where I'm just, I got a message, I'm just not feeling. And then, boom, I worship with you. I'm ready because of our collective worship and God inhabits our praises and he made it to where if you want more of his Holy Spirit you get together with two or more and he will show up it's talking with you out in the foyers talking with you in the portico I had some people oh the portico is never going to work I said watch had a couple naysayers no it's not going to work horrible idea it's too hot I said nope I said, wintertime, it's like Hawaii here. I said, in the summertime, you watch, there'll still be the vast majority there. And every Sunday, even when it was hot, sticky, sweaty, people are hanging out forever. Why? It's just an excuse to have koinonia. When you think about your favorite memories, when you think about the favorite things that have happened in your life, it's not with the message. It's usually a time of worship. It's a time at the altar in prayer with somebody else that God shows up powerfully. But a lot of times, it's just hugging each other. It's smiling together. It's having a conversation. Somebody speaking an encouraging word, having a reunion. It's walking by my sister who's clapping right here, and I go... You got a haircut. No, you didn't get a haircut. You got your hair colored. It's brighter. It's lighter. And she's like, yeah. And I love the fact that I see her so much. Not only does she give me sugar cookies when it's not Christmas and wintertime, she gives them a few times a year. Don't do it too much because I really am trying to lose weight and it's not working yet. But back to the message. 
I love the fact that I can tell when you've had haircuts. Now, guys, you guys look the same almost every time. But ladies, I can tell when you cut your hair. I can tell when you've done your nails. I can tell with your eyeglasses because ladies do the bigger shifts, right? And they just like the fact that I notice. And I like the fact that I notice because I see them enough that I can see the shifts in their lives. And when I'm gone one Sunday, my wife was like, it feels so weird. People said, Pastor, it felt like you were gone a month. I was like, thank you. It felt like a month. Man, it, woo! We can get services online. We can get worship online. I could tell you right now, my friend sitting over here, a lot of these ADD moments here, my friend sitting over here told me about a famous church. If I said the pastor's name of the famous church, you would know exactly who I'm talking about. And COVID affected 40% of this famous, incredible pastor. They're known for giving. He's one of the best person, people speaking and giving generosity and whatever. And they got 30 to 40% less people still this far after COVID because people just didn't come back also affected their giving, affected our giving. They had to let a hundred staff go, a hundred staff. Can you imagine? But he said the number one issue was online, and I'm not trying to be mean, because I know some of you can't get here. I get it. But people that could get there, that's more convenient to be by themselves online. I told a story about our executive worship pastor, Pastor Micah at the pool where they were in the apartment, it was like 50 different people that all were Christians, all claiming to go to different churches around the area and not one of them attended in person, sitting by a pool. I'm glad they're watching, I'm, but you don't get this. You can't have koinonia online. You can't have your joy be complete online. Yes, you can experience God, and I know some that can, and you're at a distance, and those that are still snowbirds, and I know some of you said that you were felt bad because you were going back home and you didn't have a home church, and what did I do? I encouraged you. I said, find a home church. Let me know. I'll try to find out if there's a good church because I don't want them to be alone. When they're there, they have a church home. When we're here, because collectively, we're the capital C church, and we will be together forever. So let's start now. I know I'm speaking to the choir. Why are you here tonight? It's not so you can be physically with me. It's because you want to sense the presence of God, and you want to be with God's people that are around you. And you can't wait for me to shut up so you can start talking. So I'm going to do that so you can have koinonia. But I'm telling some of you, get out in the foyer if you don't want to sweat in the summertime, and get out to the portico either way, and just be together and watch what happens with the level of your joy. I am blessed. I get to be a pastor. I get this all the time. I'm going to say this. I've, I've been a brave man saying this today. One thing I do not like about our auditorium, it's too big for Wednesday nights. There's something about spatial dynamics. If it's too large and it's too cavernous, people have a tendency to sit further apart. I know I'm touching on holy ground because you have your favorite seats. I do too. Mine just happen to be in the front row. But I would really like to encourage you, if you're willing, begin to just shift and move to sit with other people. There's something about being with each other. And watch the friendships you're going to make by just being near to each other. I didn't have that in my notes, but I'm just going to take the risk. How many don't dislike me because of that? I'm saying it out of love. I want your joy to be complete. Your joy will be complete when you take the joy that you have in Jesus and share it with others, and he will increase it. He will pump out God endorphins, and your joy will be complete, and it will increase as you include. So I'm just going to tell you, initiate don't wait for somebody else. Every one of you initiate and see what happens. Amen. I'm, I've run out of time. Can you just stand? I didn't realize it until now. This is probably one of my favorite chances to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. I know so many of you and I love you and I love my relationship with you, but some of you don't know each other and you've got treasures sitting around you. Some couldn't get here, but you're here on Sundays. You got treasures sitting around you. If you don't know any, anybody that's around you, go initiate. 
Don't wait for them. You be the better person. You make that initiative. Hi, how, how are you? What's your name? My name's this. Tell me your story. Da, 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 da. You want to get the best ice cold brew and the coffee? Let's go out to the portico. Let's talk. And I'll be out there and I'll introduce you guys to each other and I'll do whatever I can, but I can't do it all. Amen? Amen. I love you. I want your joy to be complete. I pray that you would just process this. Pray about that. But let's just invite the Holy Spirit to do that fresh work once again, that we would just be free in the love of Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters. I didn't even get to that, that you said the language, beloved, loving one another throughout Scripture. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would fill them to overflowing. There's such hunger. God, I thank you for just the increase of worship and the increase of freedom. I can tell in the interactions, even during the services, that people are even more hungry for you and even on the altars. But God, I pray that it would just be more organic in their daily lives, Lord, that there would just be a freedom to just do things that they've never done before and then invite people in their lives like never before. Fill them full of your Holy Spirit. Fill them full of your joy so that they can share it. And Lord, help us as we go reach, teach, and send so we can make your house full with your children in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. I love you. God bless you. Come this week in Permission Sunday, and you better not rush out without talking to each other. I'm staying right now watching you. You better slow down. I want to see some interaction. All right, keep it going. Talk as you're walking out together. You better not be talking by, to yourself or only your spouse. Awesome. I'm proud of you. Keep it going. Keep it going online. I know I'm a little crazy. We love you. See you this Sunday. Hey there, family. I'm Pastor Carrie right here at First Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service today. I just want to encourage you on your journey with the Lord, and I want to take some time right now and pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single person that's watching. God, I pray a blessing over them. I thank you for your presence in and through their lives. And I, God, I pray over the word that has been spoken, Lord, that it would not return void and not return empty to them. I pray a blessing upon their week and in everything that they have going on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about today's service, please feel free and visit our website at famfm.com. We also have an app, so feel free and download that as well and visit our social media pages for more updates on what's going on here at First Assembly. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to be with you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.